Greetings, Earthlings, and happy holidays. I hope everyone is uh, not putting on too much weight and enjoying time with the family and, uh, of course, listening to Fish. Thank you for everyone that has listened to the first three episodes of the We Are Everywhere podcast. Um, once again, if you want to be on the show, uh, just shoot me an email right here um, or just shoot me a DM if you're watching on uh, Facebook, Twitter, you just shoot me a DM. We'll get you on. Um, this week's guest is a little bit different. This is the first guest that I have never met. And he also has his own podcast, a fish podcast. So I have a feeling we're going to have a lot in common. This is Brian from the Attendance Bias Podcast. Brian, what is hey, up, Clay. man? Not nice much. To, How are you doing? It's good. It's nice to meet you. Um, before we get started, um, whenever I posted the first episode um, on, is it Addicted to Fish that I posted it? I belong to so many fish <laughs> Facebook groups. I, I can't even differentiate at this point. Right. I believe Probably. it was. I believe it was Addicted to Fish. I posted the first episode. Was super excited about it. And you were one of the first people to comment. And I was like, cool, you know, like getting some getting some feedback here. And um, you said that you had your own podcast. And you're like, sounds like we have a lot in common. And my first thought was like, because I didn't do any research of like what other fish podcasts there are. So my first thought was like, oh, shit, like I took someone's idea and they already have this podcast going. And then after I like listened to your podcast, I was like, OK, I was like. Still about fish, but different enough to like still exist in the same pond. So I'm glad to have you on, man. And um, before we start into this fish journey, go ahead and plug your podcast and kind of give everyone a feel of like what it is that you talk about on yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, so attendance bias. First, I'll do the obligatory comment that it's available wherever you get your podcast. So every outlet you have, chances are it's there. If not, you can always reach out to me and let me know. But the premise of attendance bias is I feel like when you go to a show and you sit down next to your temporary neighbor for the night during pre-show, during set break, and if you're the type that waits for the place to empty out after the show, you want to swap stories. You want to talk about fish because that's the one thing you know you have in common. So I thought that attendance bias would be have any guest on, any fan Ask them what show meant something special to them. And if not a show, maybe a specific jam from any given show that they've seen. It doesn't have to be the best jam they've seen or the best show that they've seen, but anything meaningful and heartfelt. Why are they biased toward that show? Like, what about being there made it special? And we go over um, the, the guests' history and background. We talk about fish in the context in which the show is played, and then they get to tell their story. I love it. So very, very similar, but I love, and like once I dove into your podcast, like the naming and the branding of it, like attendance bias, it's, it's genius, man. So kudos to you. It's a, it's a great podcast. If you're listening and you haven't checked out attendance bias, do it, subscribe, all those good things. It's, it's worth a listen for sure. Um, so jumping into fish, um, I'm excited because up to this point, I've just had all of my friends on, you know, like we, you have your core group and that's how I started mine too. Man. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm excited to learn some new things, hear some stories I haven't heard. Um, so right off the rip, what is that? What got you into fish? Everybody has that one moment, whether it's, you know, you heard farmhouse or you, you know, saw the old school MTV <laughs> down with disease, terrible music video. Um, what was it for you, like your first experience where you're like, oh, this is my this is my thing? So it was in the summer of 1996. I was 13 years old and I was at a summer camp. Big shocker uh, in <laughs> Massachusetts. I'm from New York, um, but I went to a camp right actually where. Uh, why can't I think of it now in Charlton, Massachusetts, which is where Treehouse Brewing is currently located. This was years before them. And I was on a field trip uh, to the White Mountains in New Hampshire. And I was with a whole bunch of older kids and I didn't really know any of them. And so I brought my 
disc man with however many CDs I could pack. And the driver, the counselor who was driving, put in a picture of Nectar before <laughs> I was a- listening to the mute, the, the discs that I brought. And I was like, I don't remember paying much attention to the album, but for some reason, when Glide came on, which I think is track 10, there was something about it. It, you know, the, the wood box in the intro and the big power chord that interrupts during the intro. Yeah. yeah. And my favorite band up to that point was the who, and I think I made some sort of connection between the intro of glide and the intro of pinball wizard, which has the acoustic oh. strumming. Okay. And then again, yeah. the big power chord that kind of interrupts one against the other. Yeah. But something fish had also, at least on the, the studio recording was impeccable harmonies, vocal harmonies. And it just seemed to me that this was the perfect song. This was everything I love in one little package. And then I started listening to the rest of the album as it was playing in the van. And I fell in love with every song more than the one before it. And then I even asked him if he could start it again, because it's like a six hour or four hour drive from the camp to the white mountains to Mount Washington. And a picture of nectar is a long album it's like 14 or 16 <laughs> tracks it is. and it's got everything it opens with llama it's got eliza it has guela papyrus landlady glide it it's got all like now what are probably my favorite classic songs and sure. it just the day i got home from camp i went to sam goody in the roosevelt field mall bought the album and it became the soundtrack pretty much up until now that's the story <laughs> That's so glide awesome. glide hooked me glide is the one that hooked you so up until that moment you had never heard fish so did you, did you just like go up to the bus driver and was like hey who is this like what's well what is this well, I, I had heard fish but i didn't know that i heard fish like i heard at the same camp a couple of years before i heard sample in a jar was uh off hoist mm-hmm. and i didn't know what they were saying I, I didn't know who it was i was probably 12 years old and i just i remember the chorus just grabbing me, even without knowing the words, the melodies automatically hooked me, but it wasn't, sure. but I was into right then I was into Pearl jam really heavy. So that was probably like 1995 or 94. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't stop to change gears and look into a new band. Cause I was already getting into Pearl jam and the who and Led Zeppelin. I was getting deep into my classic rock phase, like right. my garden variety, classic rock, all this music from 1970 is brand new to me. Sure. So uh, but I had heard fish then, so a couple years earlier. And at that same camp, it was really interesting. There used to be like chants and songs that all the all the campers and the the um the counselors used to sing during mealtimes. And there was one that I didn't get, but they would all just yell, Wilson, and bang on the table and go. Oh, and I didn't awful. know what they were doing. I would just do it with them because I was like 11. <laughs> And I thought it was fun. So right. I knowingly or unwittingly heard a couple of fish songs before Glide really got into me. That's awesome. And it sounds like your experience at summer camp, just like looking back, are is way cooler than my experience. It's, it sounds like you had a bunch of heads as like your counselors and bus drivers. Well, yeah, it was it was it was a, it was a unique place. It's still there. It's called Camp Jocelyn, J-O-S-L-I-N. And it's unique because it's a summer camp specifically for boys with diabetes. And I'm a type one diabetic and have been since I'm six. And so it's a regular summer camp. They have all the regular things like, you know, kickball and softball and hockey and hikes and all that and like traditions and all that basic stuff. But they also teach you on a daily basis how to measure carbohydrates and how to read nutrition labels and how much insulin to take and how to take care of yourself uh, you know, like if your parents aren't around and I'm like nine to 12 years old at this point. So it's really useful information for me to get more self-sufficient at a time when type one diabetes is really difficult to manage or it can be. Uh, and it was also in New England. I was in Western Massachusetts. It's not too far from Worcester. And that's at the time that was Fish's home base. Yeah, that's that's awesome, man. Like what a. Like, cause I remember whenever I first heard fish, it was through, um, I was, it was kind of similar in the fact that like, you know, whenever I'm at this age of like 12 to 13, 14, you know, like growing up and listening to my parents, listen to classic rock, I had an idea of who like Led Zeppelin and the who and all of them were just listening, what my parents were listening to. But when I really dove in and like, was like, I love this music. 
Um, I'm on LimeWire, I think it was, you know, and I'm downloading sure. all this stuff, typing in stuff, just getting all this music. I come across Fish and it was like, it, it was one of those things where I, I downloaded a couple of songs and listened to it, but didn't really process, you know, like, oh, this is like, this is cool. It was just like, oh, this is part of this falls into these certain categories. Like, I'm going to download it, listen to it. Um, but it didn't really happen until a couple of years later. And what really got me was the uh, the Brooklyn, the Brooklyn shows from oh, like sure. oh, the, oh, 2004. Yeah. I was there. Yeah. Yeah. Like the the box. It's not a box set, but like I still like see the cover of the CD. And one of my buddies had that and we would just listen to it over and over and over and over. And I was like, OK, this is pretty cool. This is pretty cool. So same time frame or age yeah. wise, I guess, getting into it. But different periods of time but that is pretty cool like the the same correlation of like starting with classic rock and then hearing it and being like oh this is yeah. a whole new thing it's not that big of a jump because there's certain bands from the classic rock genre that have just stuck around and i'm a middle school teacher so i still oh, cool. see stuff like that happen where it's 12 year olds and 13 year olds are discovering the wall for the first time ever like yeah. that's why head shops are still in business there's always <laughs> someone hearing dark side of the moon for the first time and it sticks with you and that's it connects because the guys from fish that was their contemporary music you know in right. the early and mid 70s or late 70s so no matter when you hear it it's new to you and when you make a jump to fish, there's that connective tissue because those guys, that's some of their primary influences too, amongst a billion others, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now that we have a grasp of the first time you heard fish and was like, oh, this is a cool thing. Like when and where did you make the jump to, okay, I'm going to see them live. When First off, when and where was your first show? And how long after that first show were you like, this is i'm i'm a lifer like i'm hitting every show that i can well my i the when i decided i wanted to see them live was that summer of 96 like i gotta tell you i was in right away it didn't take more than a picture of nectar to hook me like that was it that was it for me gotcha and when i got home in august from camp it turned out that fish was playing madison square garden that October. The shows are October 21st and 22nd, 96. But I couldn't go because, first of all, I was barely 13. I might not have even been 13 years old yet at that right, time. I was about to say, you're super young. Yeah. And the shows were Tuesday and Wednesday night at the Garden. And that was <laughs> like happening. a no-go, not happening. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to. But I had the rest of that year and almost all of the next, 96 and 97, to really dig deep. So my first show ended up being December 29th, 1997 at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> what a first show to have. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dude, I mean, how do you – and then I don't even need to ask what your thoughts were after that because it's an iconic show. Like, hats – I'm super jealous. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's funny because – they played a lot of songs that night that aren't necessarily on any albums. So I didn't recognize a lot of them. Like um, Run Like an Antelope. Oh, no, that's Run Like an Antelope, I think is on Lawn Boy. But right. I didn't. For me, it was a picture of Nectar hoist and a live one. And that was yeah. really all I really dug in. Plus a couple tapes. But those are all I really dug into for about a year. And it was enough for me. Gotcha. But I so my biggest memories from that night were um, they played Crossroads in the first set. They played um, Golgi Apparatus, which I knew from Junta, um, Fluffhead, I knew from Junta. And there was a jam during Possum, I think it is, when they played uh, I Can't Turn You Loose from Otis Redding, which is the Blues Brothers theme. And oh, my okay, friend yeah. Danny was going through a huge blues brothers phase and like saturday and old saturday night live phase sure. and i remember i was with my friend craig and we thought it was so funny because he was supposed to come with us and he decided not to so we were so excited to make fun of him the next day because fish played the blues brothers and you weren't there <laughs> that's awesome yeah so yeah. no i was gonna ask um like with your first because you know talking about the picture a picture of nectar like these studio cuts but i did hear you mention a live one so 
having you listen to a live one, you kind of knew going into your first show that there was jamming that was going to take place. Yeah. It wasn't but, just the studio and you weren't like, wait, what? This song is like 12, yeah, no, 13 yeah. minutes long now. Yeah, no, I'm aware. I was aware of the template that they had, like the whole way that it was set up, that the songs live are not the same as gotcha. the songs as, um, on the album. I knew that, but I there was so much I didn't know, obviously. You know, sure. I'd never been there. I, I had never met anyone else who had been. Like it was a pretty small local, me and maybe three friends I knew who had even said the word fish with a ph so it was <laughs> it was very isolated to me i didn't know a lot about them so there was a lot to discover sure oh yeah i'm sure so with it being a lot to discover were you um surprised or shocked at the fan base at all like whenever you walked in were you like oh this is kind of different than what i'm used to or was it just like oh this is cool yeah no i um I had been to a number of concerts before then, like my first concert. And this is pretty funny, actually, considering we're talking about fish was also at Madison Square Garden. And it was on October 12th, 1993. It was Billy Joel on the River of Dreams tour. <laughs> I am contra- from Long what a Island. Contrast. I'm from Long Island. I am dyed in the wool. Billy Joel will defend him to the death. I'll die on that hill. <laughs> But it was it's not a fish crowd. But up sure. to that point, I had also seen Stone Temple Pilots oh, cool. uh, by myself with one with my friend Tim at Jones Beach. My dad took me to go see Jethro Tull oh, in wicked. 1996. Yeah, at Jones Beach with Emerson, Lake and Palmer opening up. That's um, awesome. I had seen Dave Matthews before Fish in the summer of 96. So okay, like cool. I knew what weed smelled like, you know, <laughs> gotcha. I, I'd seen patchwork <laughs> yeah. and hemp necklaces. So I was yeah. kind of aware of that. But I, I remember at the fish show, I don't know if it was before the show or during set break where a guy walked by me to get by me in the row. And he asked me, he just held up a lit joint and tried to give it to me. And he asked me, you know, do you want to hit this? And again, I'm, I maybe just turned 15, like just a month prior. And I'm a cautious drug taker by nature. I'm a cautious anything. So I, I said, no, but I remember the guy's response. He went, okay, man, well, have a great show. And I thought, this is so nice. What a nice guy. (laughs) And so I I I knew I I was home. Yeah. I mean, depending on how old the guy was, I mean, it's like at you right now, like if you're at a show, like, and you saw like someone that was obviously 14, 15 years old, like, would you offer him a joint? (laughs) It's like, what's going on? If someone's like 25, I think yeah. it's they, they're like just kids, you know, I, <laughs> yeah. at this point. It's like, you got your ID, man. I keep saying, man, the crowd's really getting younger, and it's actually not, of course. I'm just getting older. Sure. You know? But yeah, that I, I mean, when I shave my beard, I still look like I'm 14. So I can't <laughs> imagine at that point. So it's good genes, man. <laughs> I guess, yeah. <laughs> well, it's good that you didn't, uh, it's good that your first show you were sober got to take it in you know for what it was i assume you were sober you might have been yes, sneaking no, beers sober. no not at, no, not at uh, that age yeah no, i hear you um that's cool though man and so after that first um that first live experience um roughly how many shows i mean you're still kind of young to like do tour but did you hit any other shows in 97 or when was your next like no well that show was during the holiday run in 97 so it mm-hmm. was it was the year was over pretty much. Um, oh yeah. Good point. <laughs> the, the problem was like you just alluded to, um, I didn't have a lot of money on my own. You know, I, I didn't, I couldn't drive. I was still two years away from getting a driver's license. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't have access. Uh, like my parents weren't into this. Like they, you know, my dad listened to the oldie station when we were in the car. So he wasn't really up on whatever was new. So I didn't see my next show until almost a year later, uh, December 28th, 98. So I had to wait till they came back around to Madison Square Garden. And I all just the take holiday the runs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I saw three out of four shows that run. I couldn't get tickets for New Year's. So I saw ah. the 28th, 29th and 30th of 98. That's <laughs> dude. That's awesome. But that's also like such like a tease. It's like you get through all the foreplay and everything. And then it's like. It's like the, it's like the person you're like with is like, well, I gotta go home now, and it's like, oh, I didn't even get to see, <laughs> I didn't yeah. get to see the New Year's show. But that's still cool though. 
Yeah, at the time it didn't even feel like I mean, I was disappointed I couldn't see New Year's because in that year between New Year's run 97 and then the one in 98, I just eating, breathing, sleeping, and drinking fish. Like there was sure. nothing, there were no other bands as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to tapes, I was collecting tapes, the internet was uh now kind of developing for mm -hmm. tape trading and such, at least to my knowledge. And I was making connections. There was a great head shop. I did a whole episode on my podcast about it called Prime Cuts in a town called Rockville Center where you could go there and they would charge you the cost of a blank tape, which was like two and a half dollars and one dollar extra. So maybe a total of three fifty, And you could just get a set. You could just get tape, get tapes of fish or the oh, dead okay. or Dave Matthews or Mo or you know, Schleho or whatever kind of random up and coming jam band that they had. And so I would take the train three stops over to Rockville Center, walk to the head shop with like a 10 or $20 bill after babysitting. And then I would just blow all my money on fish tapes. So not seeing them during the calendar year 98, it wasn't like today. Like I wasn't, I was craving it, but I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was missing out because to me it was like a non-starter. There was no way to do it. Gotcha. Yeah, no, and I'm kind of intrigued by something that you just said. So with at the head shop, what how were they getting the tapes? Like were people just bringing them in for them to sell or were they like going on tour and then coming back and selling them or how did that work? Well, my smart my smart answer should be listen to the episode on attendance bias <laughs> and find out the <laughs> the 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 short answer there is a long answer actually but and that's one of my favorite episodes personally because that place was so formative for me but basically the guy who started it named don Cantor, he was a mainstay in the dead world uh in the late 80s or the mid 80s to the end pretty much and so he had taper contacts he had lot like vendor contacts and he knew everyone and so he opened his own music store and he had the under the table cooperation of fish, um, Amy Skelton. And she said, you can't ever say that it's official. Cause if we let you do it, we're going to have to let every head shop do it. Mm -hmm. And so he just had every tape that came in. They, they had a row. I think he said at one point of 18 tape decks in the back and people would just stay up all night. This like rotating shift of tapers and they would just make tapes. Wow. And they never did high speed dubbing. They made a big deal of the quality. They always used Max L 2S 90 minute tapes. And it was just a whole operation they had going. He, I don't, I'll, I'll, this is the last one. Cause I do want people to listen to that, yeah, that yeah. episode, but uh, the Island tour, which is he, his show for attendance bias was the Island tour. I forget which one, but I think he picked the first night, the second April 2nd, because Rockville Center on Long Island is literally about a seven minute drive from the Nassau Coliseum. And it's a straight shot, a uh, street called Long Beach Road. And so if what they did was they had tapers set up at the Coliseum for the island tour, they taped it and they drove right straight to the store from the Coliseum parking lot post show. And they just started making copies of the tape so that when they returned on the next night, the third, they just gave out tapes to everybody with little prime cuts business cards they didn't charge for it they just gave them away and they did Smart. it every night of the island tour to go back and just make immediate turnaround tapes and people couldn't believe who are these guys yeah that had this hookup that the, the let's show was just played last night how do you how have, they have a tape? yeah that's amazing yeah no so so no more on that story so people can't that's yeah. a nice little teaser there i could I, talk about it all day <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. Yeah. So check out the episode on attendance bias to get the full rundown. It's called Prime Cuts. Prime Cuts. The episode Prime Cuts. Um, so now that we kind of have a basis of how you discovered Fish, your first show, we know you're ahead now. What is, and I'm sure this evolved over time. I mean, it has to because more shows are being played all the time. Um, and this is kind of a loaded and hard question. But if you had to pick a favorite jam of all time, what are you going with? See, this is what I ask my guests to do. And I'm so glad I'm the host because I don't yeah. have to do this. So <laughs> being in the opposite chair, it's a little difficult. Uh, overall, there I mean, there's so many. But the easy yeah. answer for me is Twist from November 2nd, 2013 in Atlantic City. It was, okay. it was the... 
I think it's November 1st, not November 2nd. I think it's November 1st. So it's the night after Wingsuit, and they played a version of Twist that it just has everything. I felt so good during it. There's this crazy bliss jamming, and it develops so perfectly. Trey seems like he's very on point. It seems like all the practicing they did for Wingsuit to be like note perfect for that set Mm -hmm. was coming out in their improv brains during twist that they were just as practiced and sharp and listening so well, but this wasn't a structured jam. And they ended up doing this goofy tease of under pressure by queen and David Bowie. Uh-huh. And they were getting re- that sounded great musically. And then they turned to Fishman to start singing and he doesn't know any of the words. <laughs> so it's like deflated this big dramatic power chord bliss jam into just goofy fun. And right. that's, you know, that's why I go. It's, Cause you get to see everything. Yeah. And you never know what you're going to get. It, mm-hmm. It's, it's funny. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting something as, as new as 13. Um, because you know, you're a little bit older than I am have seen shows like in, you know, 1.0 and like some, some great, some great, like, um, old school fish. And, uh, I wasn't expect, I was expecting you to like rattle off like one of like the, the top one. So I'd be like, Oh yeah, I know that jam. I know what you're talking about. So I'm going to have to go back and listen to that twist because I'm not off the top of my head familiar with it. So now I have some homework. Um, Well, there's, it's not the most musically exciting jam ever. Like for that, I would probably say from my first show, I mean, pick, take your choice, like (laughs) tube, run run like an antelope, that theme from the bottom, that fluff head, like those are, pinnacle jams of all sorts sure. and i've like you've mentioned i've seen plenty of great well-known and established performances but when i think of that question it's what what made me feel the best and yeah. that twist made me feel incredible that's awesome and, and i don't know if you mentioned were you at that show or were you just oh yes listening? yeah gotcha gotcha so that makes more sense yep. gotcha yeah no i'll have to check that out because like i said i'm not i don't know it off the top of my head um but i'm sure i'm positive that i've heard it because in 2013 and 2014, I was actually finishing up college um, as a broadcast major. And there's a, the college radio station, you know, and I had my own show. And of course, it's a fish based show and it's called The Aquarium. So every night after the shows, you know, like I'm getting on the Internet, downloading them, like playing them the next day and like, you know, dissecting them and stuff like that. So I'm certain that I've heard it, but I don't have it memorized. So I'm uh, look for, looking forward to going back through that. Um, that's cool though, man. Um, how do you know, are, are you a person that counts the amount of shows that you've been to? Do you know? Yes. Uh, yes, I am. I, uh, in fact, before I started my podcast, I used to write a blog called fish 100 one zero zero because I was approaching my 100th show. And I just, I started recounting every show that I've seen ever. And I think I am now at 141, maybe 143, somewhere around there. That's amazing. That's amazing. I got a little bit of a later start than you did. Um, and I have, do you have the, um, the helping friendly app on your phone? Sure. Yeah. 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 So after every show, like I'll go in and like update it there and, uh, I'm at 51. (laughs) So, (laughs) So about a third of what you've seen. I mean, um, is it is it still up? Because last time I tried, I think it was closing on me. All right, let me see my stats. Let me yeah, see no, it, it show works. stats. I was off. It's um 134, but I don't know if that's been updated. updated. So right gotcha. now the count is 134. Gotcha. Still, that's a significant yeah. amount. And it's so funny. I we, I was talking with on the last episode with Dave about it. Um, like you know these show numbers and you know like. When I'm talking to my family on the holidays or something, you know, obviously they know that I'm really into fish and I go see them all the time. When I tell them, you know, like, oh, I've seen 40 shows or 50 shows, 51 shows. Um, they're like, my God, like same band. And I'm like, look, I understand how that sounds, but there are people out there that have been are in the hundreds. Yeah. Hundreds. And I was like, it's not that crazy. And they're like, you spending all that money? I'm like, look, this is what I, this is my thing. <laughs> This makes me feel good. If you had Get season tickets to a baseball team or a football team, no one would bat an eye. 
exactly that's that's kind of the point that uh dave made last last episode it's like it's it's the same thing yep one sports one's music um okay let's transition a little bit here um if you and i'm sure you've encountered this before throughout your life um you talk to the people or family members you know that um maybe have heard of fish but don't really know anything about them never heard a song or anything like that so if you were going to try to I guess convert someone to be like we are and be like hey this is the best band ever um what's what's a song or a show um that you would play for them are you going the route of like hey listen to the studio albums or hey check check out this jam how would you try and convert someone if it were single tracks i would say maybe uh the first couple songs off Hoist, I think, could do it. Sample in a Jar is a great easy listening. pop song. Yeah, it's yeah. like a super easy, digestible song. Um, Bouncing Around the Room from a live one, I think, is like four minutes and whatever it is, like four minutes and 37 seconds of perfection. I think it's perfectly mixed. And if you were to go the live route in terms of a whole show, I'd say take anything from 1992. Yeah. Anything. Because they're so song focused mm -hmm. in the early, early 90s from like 1991 to 1993. They were so prolific. Mm -hmm. And most of the jams don't most of the tracks don't exceed like 10 minutes at the most. Yep. And that will dig you into fish. You will get one show will give you a sampling. I mean, I just had a guest who I interviewed the other night and his first show was in 1992 I think it's May 14th or May 17th at the Capitol Theater in Port Chester. And cool. I looked up the show. They played 26 songs. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. In, Cause in two sets and an encore. It's it's through almost it's two hours and fifty-two music uh two hours and fifty-two minutes of music. And like if you want to convert someone, here's everything you need. And you could skip a track and you've just missed maybe four minutes of a show. It's not a big deal. Right. And what I love about like what you said that. 92 to 93 maybe later in the year of 91 whenever they're really like diving like they're hitting their pockets you know they're finding their stride like even though the jams aren't there the energy and like the just execution is is unmatched i was listening to some 93 fish today and it's just like the the lock in and like they each shine through without you know playing a 20 minute jam it's what it's, show? Um, it's I actually had it on a YouTube playlist. I just typed in Fish 93 and like was scrolling through, picked one, let it play, and then just kept going and going. Um, but yeah, man, it's it's so I, I want to use the word raw, but I don't it, it there is an aspect of rawness, but it's also so it, it's they're juiced. Yeah, it's and they're playing with so much energy. That's yeah. that's the word energetic energetic man it is yeah i'm with you i'm with you on that 93 showing them a, a show from there if that doesn't hook you then you just don't like good music <laughs> uh, well you don't like fish at least <laughs> yeah, exactly um speaking of fish songs um everyone has that that one song that comes on whether it's um during a show that you're listening to or maybe you're at the show to where you're like and he went into this. All right, I'm gonna go take a piss real quick. I'll be back. What is that one song for you that you would be okay with just if they never played it again? So when I was getting to know my girlfriend and we had our first phone conversation because we met online, and she's a she meeting her was actually a result of a keyword search for the word fish because <laughs> if if he couldn't get past that, it's never going to work. Um, but <laughs> smart. we had that, we had the conversation and that came up like any songs you don't like. This is before a lot of the like soul ocean energy, love, love. and light. Yeah, yeah. All that, a lot of all that. Cause I could take or leave a lot of those songs. Even sure. though I like them at the show. I'll, I don't really care for them as, as songs. So mm -hmm. other than those, um, and this is not a popular answer. She didn't like that. I said this, but I don't I could go without Walls of the Cave for the rest oh. of eternity. See, I'm I'm halfway with you. Like the first section of it, okay like with the woodblock and piano section or 
Because yeah, I like yeah. that. Yeah, no. I, oh, I'm sure you do with the glide. That's what like initially yeah. hooked you. Um, but just like the whole, I mean, I don't want to say storytelling, but it just feels like a drawn out piece or slower piece to get to that like ending, like where it's like pumped up and like yeah. kind of rock and rollish. So I don't like the wait for it, but I like the end. But well, yeah, I mean that's. But to me, like, I'm never going to hear anything new with Walls yeah. of the Cave. It's always going to be fun in the end. But mm -hmm. that's why you go take a piss right when you know it's starting. So you get back for the good part. <laughs> yeah, because it's long enough for sure. Exactly. Um, I hadn't thought of Walls of the Cave, Walls of the Cave in a long time. Um, that wouldn't be one that would pop out to me. But now that you've said it, I'm kind of with you. Like, it's, I would be okay with not hearing that. Yeah, I also have a predisposition against a lot of 2.0 songs. Um, there okay. are some songs I still haven't really sunk my teeth into. I still think Waves is like a new song to me. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's uh, from that era. I mean, it's um, I would say and I'm using the word weird, not as in like the culture of how we would use the word weird, if that makes any sense, but that whole 2.0 era is very weird. It's it's odd, like the space stuff. And it, it's just, it seems like, well, because it is, it's a different, it's almost like a different band. It is a different band. Y yeah. In, in a sense, in the sense that you mean, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, I don't know. I would say, and this might be unpopular, but that's probably my least favorite era of fish um wh like what are i know you mentioned waves like what are some of the other songs that you're referring to or, or was it that was the only one that popped in your head well i mean it's not that i actually think a lot of those 2.0 songs that are especially enough round room and undermined the albums i think that they've really grown and come into their own in 3.0 like i think 46 days is one of the best songs of the 3.0 era Oh, sure. I, I mean, the way that they've developed their live sound and their dynamics. I mean, it it fucking kills. It's unbelievable yeah. to be in a stadium, not a stadium, but like a large arena mm -hmm. and hear 46 days absolutely crush it. Uh, but at the time when a lot of them were new, like Sense and Subtle Sounds or um, Walls of the Cave or Spices, if anyone remembers that one, there were some songs that to me just didn't hit me the right way. The way a lot of people feel about 3.0 songs. Sure. I felt in the moment the same way about two, like this doesn't sound like fish in the moment. I felt right. that way. And then a lot of the jams toward the end of 2003 and throughout 2004 were very abstract, very aimless, very like if the planetarium composer got drunk is what <laughs> yeah. a lot of the jams sound like. And I wasn't, I couldn't digest it in real time. I wasn't very happy even though I was thrilled that fish was back right. at the time, um, you could see that things were not all well and, and it can't, you could hear it. It came out in the music. And mm -hmm. so stuff like there were some jams at it, which I think is one of their best festivals overall. I just, I wasn't mentally or emotionally or maybe even intellectually prepared for, and it got too abstract and I had no grounding and no basis for it. And I blamed the songs, not the <laughs> band. I don't blame the songs now, but at the, the time, songs. I'm like, you know what? This would never happen if they were playing Antelope. Mm. That, But that's not the truth. You know, that's that was just the mindset they were in with their new music at the time. Because as we know with Fish, their new songs are the ones that energize them the most, no matter what those songs are or when they are. Like now, right. I love more, even though I don't generally like all the soul and love light songs yeah it's developed into its own and it's clear that they like playing more much more than like <laughs> david bowie for example yep yeah because they're they're juiced on it and, yep. and i love that you mentioned more because it, and i feel like this happens with every time that they put out new music at least with a handful of fans you know they get the new music out and you're like <sighs> like when joy came out you know it's like okay you know like this is okay it's a new album but yeah whatever it takes you some time to to grow on it but i will say and like even with big boat it's like mm, okay you know it's some cool stuff on here but like ah, i'm looking for something but whenever they put out sigma oasis i and you i don't know if you share the same you know thoughts on this but that album 
being like their newest out. I'm, I, I think it's perfect. I think it's, yeah. it's, I was, that was the first time that I've heard a new fish album since I've been into them and been like, okay, this is, this is what's up. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably their best album since the story of the ghost. I would uh, studio album. Yeah. Yeah. I would be inclined to agree with you at face value for right now without going yeah. too deep into it. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. It just, yeah. it's, it's, it's not just that. I mean, all the songs on farmhouse, you know, cause that would be normally what I would cite as, you know, their other most recent best album, but that's at the time, you know, when you were talking about negative reaction and backlash to new music and new albums, mm -hmm. that's, that's a tale as old as time. Like people yeah. didn't like hoist cause it was too commercial, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that it goes back even farther than that. But Sigma Oasis, I think is their best band album. Like it sounds most like fish yeah. instead of like farmhouse to me, sounds like Trey, all, <laughs> almost all of Trey's songs and fish filled in the parts, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not a bad album by any stretch. And the songs are very good, but it's not, to me, a cohesive fish album in the way that Sigma Oasis is hearing steam, a song that was what nine or 10 years old at the time it was recorded. Mm -hmm. um, it's brilliant on Sigma Oasis. It's it, it gets everything. It sounds like a fish album, in my opinion, should sound like what it could sound like if they were really able to do what they've said they want to do is get rid of all their ego and production and just kind of take a snapshot of how they're playing at any given time. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great, I think it's a great album. Yeah. They have it dialed in there. And I feel like that's what they tried to do with big boat because, you know, you listen to interviews on how they wrote it and they were like, you know, I don't know if you've seen those to where they're like, yeah, we would sit in a room and like he would come up with page would come up with this and we'd have these writing sessions and like this and that. Um, but I just didn't get as like excited about big, like after I listened to it, I was like, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is, it, it's cool. It's fish. It, it's cool, but I'm not, it, I'm, there's something missing. And then when well, the songs Oasis, aren't as good, no, they're, I mean, they're not, I'm trying to be gentle, yeah. <laughs> you know, but they're, they're really not. And then the Sigma Oasis, it's, I can listen to that. That's a studio out. I mean, cause as you know, like whenever we're going to listen to fish or turn on something, typically not turning on a studio album, you turn on a yeah. show or oh i want to hear the the bomb factory tweezer or i want to hear this um you turn on a show but i can listen to i can turn on just the sigma oasis album and be fine it's yeah i agree i love it um what else we got here oh this is kind of a fun one transitioning kind of out of the music and into the actual members of fish first let me ask you have you met any of the members or yeah not in any extended form more like a bump into so i bumped into mike a number of times both on the lot uh, but also one time i went to college at suny buffalo and i was living on long island so one time i was waiting in the airport to fly to buffalo from jfk and this was when jet blue was like brand new gotcha. and so they were one of the few accessible airlines that flew to burlington and i was in line right in front of mike gordon to check in and That's I had him, I had him sign my uh, boarding pass. <laughs> this is in 2003. I think it was right before they came back for their winter tour. So I'm very awesome. excited. And I also, in 2009, I was in Denver for the four night Red Rocks run. And I was with my then girlfriend and we were just exploring downtown Denver. Neither of us had ever been to the city and she didn't realize how it was very rainy that whole week, the all four nights it was raining and she didn't pack for it. So oh. we just were downtown and she had to run into a forever 21 to get like a long sleeve tee or whatever. And Paige was there with his daughters. <laughs> and so I, you know, I just talked to him for like three minutes or so. I didn't want to bother him too much, but I was excited. Right. And I asked if he'd, uh, if he'd take a picture with me and he said, how about a handshake? I said, <laughs> whatever you want, man, you're the, you know, you're the, you're the boss. How about a handshake? What what an answer. It's like, dude, I can't frame a handshake. Come on, man. <laughs> but I get it. It's I a mean, memory I'll take, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't I still haven't washed my hand to this day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so now knowing that you haven't you've met a couple of the members, but you haven't actually hung out with any of them. No. 
which one of the band members in Fish do you think that you would most get along with? Like, which one would you want to go to dinner with? Or just have beers and shoot the shit with? I would think, off the top of my head, I would think Fishman. Same. He seems like the most accessible, down-to-earth guy um, who doesn't act like he's a rock star. Yeah. <laughs> And that's not anything against the other three. Like I can't, you know, Paige, from what I understand, just loves driving around Burlington in his outback, like a super <laughs> outback. But he seemed Paige seems a little too like practical for him and like even keel for me. Yeah. Trey, I would I can't listen that fast. And all he he talks so much. And Gordon is just a strange duck. I wouldn't know where to begin. And yeah, Fishman you, just seems like a guy who could sit on a couch, have a couple beers, and talk about anything. Yeah, I feel like with the few episodes that we've had of this podcast, that's kind of been the general consensus. Everybody's like, "Yeah, Fishman. He, I, I he, he's the person. He's like, the everyman. Be, yeah, <laughs> salt of the earth guy. Yeah, yeah, Fishman. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe he's so down to earth he'll uh, he'll hop on the podcast. Either one of ours, both That'd of ours. That'd be nice, <laughs> Fishman." What's up, man? Um, okay, and so after knowing that you've been on, you said, uh, 136, I think your app said at this point, <laughs> uh, fish shows, um, there's so many memories, but what are some of those like favorite memories that pop out from being on fish tour? You know, um, whether it's, uh, oh my God, I can't believe this happened, or uh, so-and-so did this and we got stranded here, like, just what are your like? What's your favorite memory that just like pops in your head when you think about your past shows? I that's a really hard one. Um, when I on my podcast to get to know a guest real quick, I have a lightning round. Which okay, is kind of like um, if you've ever watched Inside the Actors Studio, where at the end the host J- has James Lipton. It's like a PBS show, I think. And he's uh, the actor studio is like a very well known, well regarded acting school, I think, in New York City. And so gotcha. he interviews these like every actor is on the mm-hmm. actor's studio, like Tom Hanks, all these hot. And so he has this questionnaire at the end where it's everything from like word association games to your favorite swear words. So I kind of took inspiration from that. Cool. And developed my own lightning round for fish. And the last question is what's the weirdest thing you've ever seen at a fish show? And okay. so I'll give my answer for that. Let's go with that. Yeah. There's too many memories. Uh, it was at the gorge in 2016. It was my first time there, which is, Oh, I was there too. Yeah. It's an experience. Unlike any other it is. It's when you talk about favorite venues, it should be excluded from an option. Right. It kind of coming exists. over, coming over that hill and seeing it for the first time. It's like, it's crazy. unmatched. Yeah. So, it is. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a type one diabetic, so I sometimes have to like sneak in little treats. Like I have, uh, I even have them right now. I think um, I go to, yeah, I have uh, like little fruit snacks that I yeah. have, like just in case of a low blood sugar. Yeah. And for some reason, they were very strict at the gorge that year with the pat downs, and they wouldn't let me bring in my fruit snacks. And I was, I tried to make a big stink out of it, you know, like. And the for I think I got away with having a couple in one pocket, whatever it was. The reason that I bring that up is because at the gorge, there's the gigantic lawn. Mm-hmm. And then in between the lawn and the actual like pit of the venue, like the the concrete, there's like a walkway, like a corridor in between the two. Yep. And in so if you could picture that space, right? I don't know mm-hmm. if it how well it'll show up on screen. But this is the back on, this is the front and the stage. So mm-hmm. there's a middle walkway right there. And at the edge of the walkway, it rises up into a hill where there's a chain link gate just yep. to prevent people from falling over. And I was walking to go to the bathroom, one of the shows, and there was a guy with no shirt on the little ledge in front of the chain link gate with a literal, a literal chain wrapped around his waist and the other end of the chain was tied to the gate. So he could dance as wildly as he wanted and he wouldn't fall off the ledge. I can't bring in a pack of fruit snacks, but this guy <laughs> got snuck a chain in six feet of chain. What? I, 
I couldn't believe it. I even asked my girlfriend to go to the bathroom and just look out for him to make sure I saw what I thought I saw. <laughs> and I, and she came back and she described exactly. I said, I didn't even tell her what to look for. I said, when you go down, look at the little edge in the in-between area. And there's like a fence. Just tell me what you see with a guy dancing there. <laughs> she come back and say, there's a dude chained up like a pit bull. Yeah. <laughs> it was around his waist and he was dancing like crazy and it's the weirdest thing in the world. When you see it, it makes it doesn't make obvious sense, but it makes sense why he would do that. What he's doing it's steep. Like if you fell over, he would smash into a concrete walkway. Right. It's... But how how he got in with that and I couldn't get in with technically what might be considered medical supplies. A hundred percent. And yeah. I just I it was weird to see of its own volition, but add that layer to it. I just it's the strangest thing I've ever seen at a fish show. <laughs> You're like, what's this is, so it is a favorite is weird. memory. It is a favorite <laughs> <Yeah>. memory. <laughs> that is, but dude, I can I can confirm that the security that year at the gorge. Uh, that was my only time at the gorge. Me um, too. I had like my camel back on, and I was trying to sneak in beers. So I have like the water pack that you have to empty out, and then under the water pack, I had like three or four beers, uh, and that's like my typical thing. Like they never like they fill, you know, and all that, and it's, it's good. And this dude that was patting me down, like he, like he, one, he violated me. I was like, yeah. dude, what, what are you going to find under there, bro? Like, I don't have anything up my ass. Like, come on. <laughs> and then two, he found my beers and like, I was like, all right. And like, try to throw two of them out. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, I felt more in there. And he was just like hounding me, like hounding me, hounding me. And I was like, finally, I was like, damn, dude. All right. And I think he took a pipe too. And I was just like, God. So like they, if you're going to a show at the gorge. Don't try to sneak anything in, whether it's yeah. beers or fruit snacks. You might get away with the chain. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not a problem, apparently. <laughs> I wonder how that guy got that in there. Like that's, that's what I'm saying. And then hooked it up to a fence and tied it around his waist when no one is seeing it. Yeah. Maybe the logistics we don't want to no know sense. how. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we don't want to know how we yeah. got it in there. Oh, uh, it's funny. Um, well, Brian. Thank you so much. I know we've been back and forth on email trying to connect and make this happen. Thank you so much for taking the time and coming on the podcast. And I would love to return the favor and be on attendance bias at That'd some point. And um, anything else, uh, fish related or life related or anything else you want to plug uh, before we hop off here? No, I'll just repeat again. The show is called Attendance Bias. It's two words. Uh, it's a big yellow icon with a black guitar and the title of the show right on there uh it's available wherever you get podcasts i've had some really great guests on both names that you'll recognize and names that you wouldn't uh but everyone's got a story to tell and sure. that's the place for it so if you're into fish if you're into if you like sitting down next to someone a stranger at a show and trading stories it's the podcast for you i love it it is a good podcast. I've listened to Thank a you. couple because I started at the beginning. One of the first guests you had on was um, Eliza, right? She from, was the first guest. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa Alishant, yeah. From yeah. Serious Radio. Yeah. Um, so I got into that one. And then the next one, I think I listened to your intro and then that one. And that's where I'm at so far. Um, but yeah, it's good. Better. I will say better production value than this podcast. You got the song <laughs> and everything. You do some editing. I like it. It's very good. Um, well, once again, thanks for taking the time, man. I'm looking forward to being on your sh on your show, and uh, hopefully I'll see you on uh, tour. Sounds great. Thank <laughs> you so much for having me, Clay. Yeah, you bet, man. Thanks again.